As a way to end this series of episodes on configuring a Rack Fusion Live from ground up, we want to go back to the default configuration provided by Skyhoy and see if there's anything we can learn from it. Unfortunately, most people who have studied the default configurations come to the realization that they are really difficult to learn from because they are so advanced in their buildup. And that is because the default configurations we have made are designed in a very flexible way because that is kind of what we could not do on Unisketch and what we really dreamed about doing on, on, on Reactor and the Blue Pill platform. So um, this is why we are so proud of the default configuration. But yeah, they are difficult to learn from. But having gone through this configuration, I think you are you know, pretty savvy on configuring and understanding the config tab. So maybe we can actually learn something in the light of what we have just experienced. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, just let's quickly configure this to, um, if you hold down shift, you can add a number of cameras here. So we'll just from our device collection, add a, um, a few PC cameras. And uh, we already have the ATEM switcher input here related to index number one, which is fine. And uh, so it actually may, means that we are sort of in business already. We can switch around on our ATEM switcher. We can do a cut and so on. We also have camera selection over here. We get values out of the cameras. so. This is all uh, nice. In in our case, we um, we also set up um, things in these menus pretty successfully. We had a little menu key here. We did not work with presets, but we could at least uh, cycle through different menus up here. So all those things we learned from from what we did. But what we have done now was to just basically pick a, a standard configuration. And these constant sets are the ones brought out on the home screen for us. So let's see how far we can get. It's not sure that we can fully understand everything. But first of all, we notice that the constant sets on the home screen are brought out on this level in the configuration. And you see a reflection of them on the imported layer. So this layer would correspond to the one we call Rack Fusion. That was our the, the configuration we built up in a file of its own. And there you find a bunch of constant sets already. For instance, the ATEM inputs for the switching, 44 inputs are already defined. And um, they are there, uh, but the other ones doesn't have interest. We, they got interest down here. Now we added you know, the three cameras. We also, um, let me see, we have the 44 inputs here. They were copied. We have not done anything for routing and teleforwarding, but we just added the camera. So we can see those while up here, that constant set is empty, while that one is the one that we copied down into this one. So those are the similar ones. OK, um, what is the key map? We have seen that before, mapping panel one to panel one. Um, that's kind of um, mundane here. It's It means a whole lot more if you have uh, multiple panels managed by Reactor, then that panel mapping makes a lot of sense. But we won't cover it here. Import video, video mixer. So we are importing a. Um, Ah, OK, that's a nice point, because actually what's happening right here is that we are importing a um, layer for the uh, ATEM. You see, it's we're importing a layer file called Skyhoy Controllers Lifefly ATEM Classic. So that, that kind of means that we are dealing with a configuration. Although it's called ATEM, it is still just a container that is pulling a configuration for Lifefly for ATEM and it is pulling a configuration for PDC fly as you'll see up here because this import PDC control is importing PDC fly generic. Ah, that's interesting. See a live fly and a PDC fly are two Skyhoy controllers and they both have hardware component number one. So how does that get down onto the Rack Fusion Live? By the way, how do I know that? Um, well, Let's just quickly see if we can start our emulator. The raw panel dummies is an emulator that can emulate Skyhoy panels. It is so great if you want to develop with raw panel protocol and Skyhoy products. You can do that without owning our hardware. You can get as far as you want, basically, until you really need tactile control to develop your applications. In this case, um, it is a sort of useful thing. It's my go-to thing when I want to um, see the hardware component numbers. Rack Fusion Live. Uh, comma PC fly comma live fly. I can bring up what we see right now are three simulated controllers or emulated controllers. Now, uh, what I was talking about is the fact that this button on a rack, uh, sorry, live fly is number one. 
This button is number one on the PVC fly. And if you go to the right fusion live, this is button number one. So actually the whole PVC, uh, so the, sorry, the live fly part of the right fusion live is kind of mapped one to one. It seems like this is 31. This is 31. That's fine. But the PVC fly side is starting at 32. And you'll actually see a reflection of that. If we go in here, then you'll notice that down here in, in, in the uh, key maps that is uh, following along on each of these import uh, layers. Actually, on this one, there is no such thing because the live fly maps straight onto the Rec Fusion Live. But this key map for the PVC control does something interesting. It takes any reference to button number one on the PVC fly and maps to button 32 on the Rec Fusion Live. Let's just check that. If we, uh, sorry, I think I need to reopen my emulation view here. So button number one here maps to button number 32 on the PVC fly, oh, sorry, Rack Fusion Live. And that's exactly what we saw back uh, in this table. You see button two to 33, so on. So actually they are also just numbered like that, but this is how we make sure that the PVC fly configuration that we are importing right there gets mapped onto those buttons over here. By the way, isn't it clever that we have PVC fly configurations that are just mapped onto another controller that has that as a part of it? This is uh, how we are reusing a whole lot of uh, configuration inside of React all the time and why it gets kind of complex, right? Let's look into the PDC, uh, LiveFly. Uh, if we click on, on um, let's open this up a little bit more so you can see more of what we are doing. The uh, auto button, the cut button, the encoders up here are defined. You see this one and this one. The fader is defined on the root layer, just like we did in our configuration. The LED bar, what is that, by the way, linked to? That is also linked to the Blackmagic Atom transition position parameter. So um, that's in place. And then let me see, it's, it's using the transition behavior, actually, just like the fader does. So both, yeah, actually it is, no, it's it's actually two different things. It's fader and LED bar, they have the same thing assigned to them. That's also a clever way of doing it. The shift key is just working with the shift variable that is right here, default. So it's a hold down action. If we use the, you know, simulate, you can see that the, the value of the variables is changed. Up here we have that, we call it state in this case. And that is uh, the, the menu, the one we called, I think, switcher menu. And as we're pressing the edges of this one, we're going forth and back here. Ah, device index is another interesting thing. See, many of the actions we are using in this case is, um, <clears throat> and I think if, if we just click on someone, you know, one like this one, notice that we are referring to the Blackmagic ATEM device call, but we're using a variable called device index to point out the device. Instead of hard coding the value one, as we have done, we are using this one to point out the device. We're also using a variable to point out the ME row, which makes a lot of sense if you want to have a button that changes between the ME rows, like it could almost look like this is actually doing. Is it? No, it's not. It's doing something, something different. Point is, these two variables, device index and ME row, are essential for this configuration to work. But as variables, they may not be manipulated by any any variables inside. You see, there are two options for the ME row. So I guess if we, I mean, maybe we can see that if we change over to the other ME. Yeah, you know, all the inputs because there is no MEs on my ATEM Mini, but it defaults to the first one, especially if we set that option. Let's see, add option, show more. No, wait, that, that's got to be in show more a default value of one. Yeah, okay. But you normally would just check that one default to first and it will take the first value. So that's sufficient in most cases. Now, um, the ME row, what about that one? Yeah, okay, that's the one we looked at. What about this one? Yeah, we have like main ATEM and backup ATEM. Once again, it will take the first value because it is defined to be the default value of the variable. And this is, you know, why they are just driving the inputs. But once again, if I, if I kind of set it over here and I changed over to that one, it would blank out. But hey, actually, if I went to the home screen and I added an additional ATEM switcher, should I be able to find one on our network, which may not be the case anymore? Oh, yeah, there are some ATEM switches. Okay, so let me see. Which one will we grab? 
two ME Constellation HD. Okay, let's pick this guy. It's gonna get device ID number two because they are usually numbered like that. Connecting to both of them, going back to configuration, trying to change this variable over so that the device index is the backup atom. And now you see a different atoms which is pulled in and populating the whole thing here. Isn't that cool? I mean, yeah, awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, let's just check if we can actually operate this. I guess we can. So yeah, we are changing sources on the different atom switcher now. Just because we changed device index to two, we can set that back to one. Okay, <clears throat> let's move in and see what else we have. We were exploring, right? So uh, Fairlight audio available. Now you see that the visibility of this one is actually depending on whether a parameter in the device core is true. So if audio levels is enabled, we are apparently driving LEDs here. Okay, that makes a lot of sense to drive it this way. The behaviors is, um, let me see, the, the generator here is uh, using shift levels. It's using the, the inputs from the constant set. We are putting this as the prefix over here. And the question is what the template behavior does. It is auto meter template. And um, yeah, so it provides audio, you know, we are using that master behavior audio meter to give us feedback in these LEDs. That's not something we can simulate, unfortunately. But you see it's also responding to, um, yeah, to shift. What about Fairlight audio up here? So, no, wait. It's like, mm, okay, it's probably either or. And that is because the atom switcher, some atom switches has the Fairlight audio engine inside and that requires something else than switches without. So to be compatible with these, we are basically looking if Fairlight audio levels is true in the switcher. And that is likely to be mutually exclusive, these two. So only the one or the other would be, you know, available at, at any time. The um, program preview source selection is a generator like the one we have done before. So this actually looks pretty much like what we have done. Just notice that it is actually deriving its page size from a config size generator page source here. So what, is, what does that mean? It means that inside that there's this constant set. And if I go in here and if I say, oh no, it's one of those. We saw it in our version as well. So huh, we need to go and so there's a bug in the UI that will keep us from changing that unless we go in here and add, I think, front end meta. We just need to create that object and we should be good again. So let's just do that. And once again, when the software hits you, it will be absolutely bug free, I guarantee. <laughs> well, um, that's how the world works. Now we can see it. Okay, so if we change the page size to say three, then it should actually not be bigger than this. Let's try it. Let's try it. Okay, so we change that over and you see now we have a page size of three. What does that mean? It means that inside our ATEM LifeFly configuration, you know, we have these two shift levels. So it's just going to support up to six sources. Distributing, by the way, if we change over, you know, I think we can right click. No, wait, we can't. We go in, in here. Now we can right click, hold down. Then we can navigate back and we can see now we have camera four, five and six because we were sort of holding down the shift key and now we are back to camera one, two and three. Okay, so that was us changing that config size right here in that field. We just put that back to nine like that and it's gonna fill in the whole controller like uh, it normally does because up here in this generator, it is generating these behaviors, including a shifted level. That is absolutely like what we did. This one up here, audio channel status is actually, um, it's, it, oh, by the way, by the way, we have, uh, let me see, we call these B. Yeah, okay, not a big deal, but you know, instead of A, we are prefixing them B here, but it just means that in the um, HVC key map down here, we are mapping all the aliases called B1 to nine to the buttons that we would normally, we call them A because that happens automatically as we created it. Uh, audio, audio channel status is basically taking over if our state is audio. So notice that it's just like using these keys, but if we are in the menu, like uh, going over here for audio, right there. Okay, so now this variable state is equal to audio and then this one is taking over 
the keys down here. And for whatever reason, audio is not enabled or available in this ASIM switcher, so there's nothing to see. I don't know exactly what would have been there. But I'm also here to explain the layer structure to you guys. If we venture in here, we have macros. Um, so everything inside of here is just like our little menu was having a, a this is called state the variable but we called it switcher menu or something like that and it had different options but same thing so let's just go and go through these you can see that as we are cycling we are creating or we are affecting the um, visibility of these just like we did in our configuration okay so i think there was something we could learn from this if we move into the pdc area yeah, we have a ton of variables here, quite a lot. We also have, um, uh, we actually do have something that is not even used under controller. Extend extended paging one and two are only used on a PDC Pro, but they are sharing configuration bits and pieces. If we go to uh, this one, I think menu navigation, menu navigation would be this key. So there you have quite an extensive, if you go in and you look at all these, you have you know quite a bunch of event handlers. So that's a complex key. We have a different video that tries to uncover how that works. Um, joystick button is essentially the button on top here. And what that does is to just set the value of setting page to home. That means as you press that one, the menu up here goes to home. So you can learn from, learn from that as well. Um, all these variables, what are they for? Show camera selector, show and hide uh, is basically driven by this one, whether you see camera selection here or if you see, um, um, whether you see preset pages or camera selection, you see those are two things that happens when you press the low edge. We have the setting page that is driving what you see up here. And now that value is one of those that has, if you look at show more, it has capture set. So that resembles what we are doing. Basically, if we go into the normal operation in closing layer, we find camera control layers and we go into Canon uh, standard class here. Then inside of this one, it's it's importing a configuration from this file. And inside of here, you will find the variable preset page defined right there. And if you show more, you'll, oh wait, that's not preset page I was looking for. It's this one setting page up here in camera adjustment. Now it is it is kind of grayed out just like we have seen before. And that is, uh, but this is the pages that are possible. Okay, so um, let me see if we can actually set those. Am I, I'm on the Panasonic, so I should actually go to Panasonic instead. Okay, so we'll just open this, but it's the same structure that you find inside. The file is here, camera adjustments. And for the camera adjustments, we have setting page right here. Let's see if we can change these. Okay, so this is probably not working as it should. Because in this case, oh, let's just try up here. So you're seeing we are paging through these. We are paging through these. And unfortunately, it looks like setting the value of the variable may not be dependable when we are using this expand scope feature. So expand scope meant that these five options were pushed down onto, on top of the ground setting page variable here. Okay. And if we go over to the Canon camera. And if we do that, then notice that we are basically changing the link selector variable. Notice that these, these two configurations that are being included by a generator right here is actually looking at a constant set and it is seeing, oh, for camera number one, we'll import this configuration. For camera number two and three, we are gonna import two other configurations. Because you notice as I'm changing, and I'm going back here, now it is enabling that one. That's because link selector is looking at this string instead. So just look at link selector variable right there. It is changing when I go to, to Panasonic. Now it's changing over to Panasonic, but it's going to stay the same value for both of the Panasonic cameras. So by the way, these, these actions for camera selection down here, it kind of resembles what we did. It does multiple things. It is setting a device index and it's also setting a uh, link selector name. And how can we know? Well, now we're looking at the generator that drives this because this is also automatically generated out of the constant set of all the cameras. It's um, also a behavior type. It is taking out from the camera selector here. It has the style pages. Pages means that it will, uh, shift level allows you to have, you know, it, it just adds a layer if you have enough interest in your, in your um, a constant set, like we saw for the switching. but. Pages means that it 
every single thing, uh, single thing gets into a, a page of its own. Size five, and um, yeah. So the camera selector is up here. I think on top of all of this, this is a camera selector right there. So this is driven by the generator um, for for the number of cameras that we might have in the system. Um, these are actually just blanking out. So these make sure that these are empty. These two are empty because there's nothing inside of them. But if we go to the template behavior, you see that it's drawing on a apparently complex master behavior here that has a ton of constants, like the camera name, the color, the index, device index, which would be different from these two, the link selector, and the routing index and tally index. So a lot of things happens, and I couldn't go through it all. But let's just focus on two things, device index and link selector. All right. So we. Um, so at least those must somehow inside of this master behavior, if you go into this ton of event handlers that is you know, driving it, then uh, you would see things happening. So let's, let's just choose between these two cameras. Notice the device index up here. No, it changes between 10 and 20. And we remember 20, 10 and 20 was the device indexes we chose for the Panasonic cameras. If we go to the Canon camera, we go back to index number one and the link selector changes. So those two things are being changed somewhere inside these event handlers based on the constants that come in. And ultimately, they come in from the constant set out here, namely the camera selector that we so easily filled in by just picking cameras from the list over here. And automatically, it picked the device ID 10 and 20 and device ID 1 for the Canon. And it even spotted which configurations would be the best for us to use. Because inside these configurations, we have made note of which cameras that they support, which device calls they are basically linked up to. So this is why this table ends up as it does. But this configuration here is actually the link selector value. And the device number is the device index. And that's the one that we are having inserted in the configuration. So that basically chooses between whether we have, um, well, the camera selector is, is here and is always visible unless we disable it by the lower edge of the menu button. So that that is the show cam selector, show and hide. That's this variable down here. You know, we're just changing that with the lower edge of this button. And basically, if we show it, that means our camera selector is going to overrule presets. Presets are just underneath. So we're just hiding the layer. And then underneath, we'll see presets. And the presets are coming from whatever, which one of these are selected. So in this case, the presets selection we have here is inside the Canon config. So that presets could be specific for Canon, like how many presets or you know, labels or whatever features might exist. Um, it's outside the scope of camera adjustments because camera adjustments is basically just for you know a bunch bunch of pages like we have done ourselves. But preset control is also generated by a behavior, uh, sorry, a generator. So let's just focus on this one preset control up here because that's the one that that we are seeing. We have a page size of five, you know, related to that. We use an alias called preset, so that means that we actually get behaviors inside that are called preset. But if you look at the camera selector up here. You will notice, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. If you look at the camera selector, which are you know affecting the same keys, you see that the aliases are called cam one to five. So how can it be that cam one to five maps down on these keys, but if we are looking at presets, preset one to five maps down on these keys? And I'll tell you in a moment. Now this one is drawing on a constant set as well. Where is that constant set? It is somewhere uh, like right there. So these that ah oh, now it is broken again. I would uh, I'll just show you from in here. But the constant set called paint presets. No, maybe not that one. But then presets here. You know it's simple. It has just an ID and it's an integer. I should say integer. So that's a mistake. Um, and uh, let me see. And it has sets, just simple sets, one, two, three, four, and so on. This is how we make sure that there are 20 presets available for the Canon cameras, basically. That's by doing that. Let's go back here. Uh, so drawing on that, we are generating the preset pages. And that makes sense, right? 20 cameras results in four pages of five um, behaviors. So we can we can easily understand that. Preset page is a variable that drives the paging here. So I think that is also pretty easy for you guys. But I was promising you one thing, a little bit of a glimpse into why on earth were these behaviors named cam1 to 5 mapped to the same keys. And that is because on this layer, let me see. 
We need to go all the way down here. Five aliases are mapped. So now look at the beauty here. From inside camera control layers, anything named preset one to five gets now mapped over to cam one to five, which means that from this point on, all the preset buttons that were defined in there are now renamed to cam one to five. And thereby they will end up hitting the same keys because down here in this configuration, we have a mapping that says that cam one to five should go to button number one, two, three, four, and five. And then if we go even further down to the, um, let me see, we talked about the map PTC control. This is why you see that buttons one to five get mapped to buttons tw uh, th 32, three, four, five, and six. I don't know if we have much more to check. I mean, there's this engineering menu, but it's kind of rudimentary. It's just a variable driving visibility for standard behaviors that um, you can enable it if you press and hold the upper edge on the menu key here. So that's an interaction design. How, how do you make a key do something when you hold it down for like one second? But we won't look at that here. Um, I think mostly these gets mysterious because of all the generators. And um, I totally follow you guys. Um, I don't want to get into this because here we are talking about virtual triggers. And um, do we have virtual triggers on this page? I wonder exactly what happens in here. Honestly, I'm not sure myself. Channel pages. Oh, wait. Maybe we'll just go in here. Do we have virtual triggers in here? Maybe it's generating some. I'm, I'm not sure. I would need to read up on that. So let's just ignore that and, and still think that Casper is brilliant. Um, I don't know everything. I mean, <laughs> I, I forget some things, even though I designed the system, then it's a long time since I worked with it. But at least here we have some virtual triggers. So even for virtual triggers, you can do something clever with your uh, generators to, um, to, to create uh, virtual triggers in a smart way. Okay. Mm, but actually what I wanted to say as an ending note is preset control here is the presets that we get here. So what is preset control extended? Well, it's 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 uh, 10 presets and that's what we use on a, a PTC Pro where we have dedicated 10 buttons. And um, therefore we have it built into this configuration because we, we are sharing it between PTC Fly and PTC Pro. And therefore we kind of get it in but it's just there in the system. We're not using it for anything. They're not mapped to anything. So this is why you, you don't see the consequence. And the same is true for thumbnail presets control. That is if you have a, a frame shot, a controller from Skyhoy that has the ability to show you color thumbnails. And, uh, or it could be MKA2. So uh, these are also in the system, but we're not using them on the PC fly. So these aliases are just ending up in out of space, never mapped to anything on the controller. And that would also be confusing when you look at it and you think, oh, what happens to those and what significance do they have? And we don't have tools to really, you know, highlight that well at this point in time. If you have anything that ends up in outer space, you just don't know because there's nothing inside of Reactor that will reveal it to you. And um, that's the point that we could definitely improve in the future. Yeah. Okay. So um, that's a little bit of an attempt to explore how the standard configuration for a Rack Fusion Live is actually made. And it would even be possible for you to kind of mimic some of this. And for instance, you could import the whole PDC section of a, such a controller like this one. And then you could just, you know, use your own video switcher section if you wanted. That would be one thing that's possible. I also do think that it's still possible to manipulate what would be inside of here. So let's say that you really want to um, to change a little bit what you find for the for the Canon cameras on the pages that you can go through. Let's say focus mode. If you don't want photo focus mode right here, you should still be able to navigate into the camera control layers, go into the Canon PDC imported layer here, go up to the camera adjustments page. And here you'll see the focus page. So if we click on this one, just go out of simulation mode, you know, or we can pick any of these, you know, they'll, because they are the, the active ones, we can go explore. And um, one thing we could do would be to just type up dummy, dummy to see that a change of this would actually make a change here. So now it says dummy, uh, which of course is not what we want. We will typically want to, to uh, see, okay, Canon, device index, that's all fine. Let's find focus mode. mode. Um, 
uh, what do we want? White balance um, mode. Just pick this, submit. It's gonna be set here, it changes over to step change, it shows Kelvin here. So yeah, you can actually modify the default configurations. Would it be possible to take a page out? I would say so. You should be able to uh, go down here on, on this variable and then you could basically say, okay, I, I just, you know, the quick and easy way of doing this would be to, to remove a few of these. So now we have only two options left in the menu. So what does that mean? It means that if we if we go in here and and um, we can look at the, the pages that are available, we see we're currently on home, but then as I'm pressing the upper edge, you know, I go to page number one. As I'm pressing the upper edge again, I'm going back to home because now I only have these two options. I still have all the other pages, so I could now start from one end. If I don't want them, I could remove them like this. Okay, but basically it was a quick way to just change the variable down here, the setting page variable that has these options and are pushing them down to the lower variable down here, setting page there, to just you know remove the options. Or you could reorganize them if, if you want, although I don't see any drag and drop function here, but actually it should potentially be possible to reorganize the, the options to have it differently. I mean, you could even go and uh, let's say we add an option like whatever, which doesn't have any equivalent that should actually disable our menu. So let's see if that's the case. Uh, we have these options up here. Let's just um, yeah cycle the pages. And now it is going to the value whatever, is it not? I think it is. So it says whatever right there and it blanks out because there's no page responding to whatever. Now, once again, you would expect that because you have already learned how Reactor works and now we have two options to go between. Yeah, thank you for following. And um, hope to see you in a different video. And this was useful. Please send us comments because we love to hear how we can make more great training material. There's a lot to do also in the UI and we would love to receive feedback and ideas for how to improve and make things easier. Workflows that we want to support, um, ideas about yeah, things you do repetitively or things that could help you to have a better overview. All such ideas are welcome because uh, over the next time we want to make Reactor more and more easy to use for all the generic workflows that people have, while what you have seen right now is how amazing a foundation it already is.